So qualifying came out and everyone goes into that corner after going like 140 on that backstretch, hits the brakes, and there's just oil there. And everyone just goes straight. It was so uh, I, I, I can't imagine how somebody sane would feel after experiencing that. But us racing drivers don't care too much. Welcome to the Owner's Pride podcast. I'm your host, Dan Williams, Dan E. Williams. And yes, the E stands for Eco Wash, the drought tolerant, eco friendly way to wash your car or race car with just a little bit of water. And you know what? It's fast. Amazing. Please help me welcome my special guest for today, Mr. Jason Pribble, who is a, a race car driver. He has been racing since he was six years old. He is um, just gener- just gone up to the to the Ford cars on his way to racing Indy cars. I'm assuming um, we're going to dive into his background, find out where he came from, where he's going to. All things about Mr. Jason Purple. Jason, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great. Thank you, Dan, for having me on. That was a wonderful introduction. I'm I'm excited to get to talk about myself, as I always do. So <laughs> ready to get this started. Right. It's really fun to be on the other side of an interview where you tell your own story. Um, I, I enjoy that myself. I really do. I really yeah. do. But this one ain't about me. It ain't about me at all. It ain't about me at all. Um, what a interesting... At twenty, you're twenty three years old now, currently, right? I'm uh, I'm eighteen. Holy macaroni! Well, that's even even more incredible, actually. I don't know why, where the heck I was going with twenty three. You know, what blows me away. You guys that are racing cars, and and you're racing like when I started driving at sixteen years old, I had to get a four cylinder car. I can't. Do you? How long have you had a regular car and driver's license? Uh, I've had a regular, I've just, you know, standard two years. I started driving when I was, I started driving when I was 15 with my permit. And that's all we're going to say. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's, um, that's the basics. Getting to, um, getting to drive on the road is completely different, but I'll, I'll let you continue on and I'll get on my tangent later on. You know, no, I, but let's go there first before we go anywhere else. So like if you're, you get to drive race cars and drive fast, how is it to go sit in a regular car with like what has to be a lot of jackasses on the regular mean streets? Like how, how do you feel about that? And does that help you with the racing at all? Yeah, you know, so I, there's there's assholes on the track and there's assholes on the, off the track uh, to put it as crudely as possible. I don't like to use that word, but at the same time, uh, it's endearing to me at this in 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 a, in a way. But um, I don't think uh, driving on the road has ever really helped me. Uh, but driving a race car has definitely helped me. Um, being able to you know, kind of predict what people are going to do. Because at the end of the day, everyone who's behind the wheel is still a person. Everyone thinks pretty similarly. Uh, and on the racetrack, there's not really laws when it comes down to moving into someone else's lane, stuff like that. So at the end of the day, driving on the road is way easier. It's just a little bit more tame. And all drivers, at some point, all racing drivers like to kind of calm down for a time. And, uh, you know that's my way of calming down is just to kind of drive on the road. You know, I think maybe what you just said right there might be the key. At least when you're on the track, it's predictable. You know what they're trying to do and you know that they're trying to get it in front of you and uh, on their regular streets. You just don't know. And they, they apparently seem to give a driver's license to anybody. (laughs) Nowadays it seems that way. I mean, I, I know when I came around the the big C and all that, um, my license test and my license class and all that was pretty unique. I think I'm lucky the fact that I, uh, you know, am a race car driver. I don't, well, I ne- needed to learn the road laws, of course. Learning how to drive a car really wasn't in my agenda. But for a lot of people, getting a driver's license was a little bit more difficult than just taking the class and filling out the credits because um, a lot of people need to learn how to drive cars. And uh, in recent events with online, I mean, I took an online driver's ed course and um, that went 
how you could expect. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's do this. You started actually driving carts when you were six years old. So let's jump into the Wayback Machine and go back to your very first memory of ever uh, of, of driving a cart that you can remember at your best. I know it's a little bit fuzzy at six years old, but hey, it was only a couple of years ago. <laughs> a couple of years ago. Oh, man. I, you know, I, I don't remember everything that went around with it, right? Um, at that age, I sort of just showed up to the track. My dad put me in a cart and I went around the track as fast as I could. Um, but when I first ever got into a cart, I, I remember my dad asking me, he said, like, do you want to at least give this a try? And of course I said, yeah. Um, and we, he posted on a Facebook group asking if anyone was willing to lend out a cart to drive, you know, for me to learn, for me to see if I had any interest, to see if my dad had the guts to watch me go around the track. And um, it was a slow start, but I, I remember that feeling of like, you know, sort of getting bored of how slow I was going and how slow the cart I was in was going to the point where I would just throw it into a turn and I was like, well, let's see if I could spin this out. And uh, <laughs> I, I still remember that feeling of spinning that cart out. And um, that's that's the main thing I can remember from the very first time I was ever in a cart. Okay. So did your, your pops is who got you into this. Do you come from a family of racers? Was he a racer, your grandpa, your uncles, any of those people? No one was a race, race car driver. Nobody did any racing. My dad was never into sports. He's a computer guy. Uh, he works on cars occasionally. He had a, he still has a Volkswagen bus. It's uh, been decommissioned at the moment, but he spent some time working on it. So he had an interest in cars, but it was never an interest in racing cars. Um, the way it all started was my grandfather and his friends would always go up to June Sprints Road America and uh, they would watch the races. And then when my dad was old enough, my grandfather took him to the racetrack to watch racing. Uh, when it was my turn, I caught the bug. It, it was like, not only was I like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. I love watching these cars go faster on the track. It was, I got to do this, you know? And, uh, we happened to be paddocked. Road America has a cartplex. I don't, I don't actually know when it was built. Um, but we were paddocked right around where that cartplex was and we saw carts going around and that's sort of where the idea sprang. Got it. So road, that Road America, that's a big, big race track. Yeah. Yeah. Four point, uh, four point two miles, I believe. Um, that's road America has got a special place in my heart. Definitely. Now, was that the first track that you went to or, or did you, um, because I know we said grandpa, right? So I know like some of these, um, smaller and maybe they're not as prevalent now as they used to be in, in years gone by, but there was a lot of really small regional and local race tracks too, where you would have your like stock car drivers there and stuff. Did you guys ever go to any of that stuff? Like see where they do the figure eights at the end of it and they race school buses <laughs> and all kinds of crazy stuff. Oh, man. I, I wish I, um, we, we were never into oval racing. Uh, I've done oval racing from time to time, you know, just on the simulator. I actually did try it um once in go-karts uh just with my regular go-kart there's there's oval go-karts and then there's road course or sprint course go-karts whatever you want to call them um and then we entered a race with my sprint cart go-kart into an oval race and that that was interesting it uh was an experience uh the oval oval racing scene is very different um i actually went to my first oval ever oval race in my life I think four or five months ago, uh, Slinger Super Nationals was my first ever, ever oval race. I didn't even realize it until I went there and I was like, this is a very unfamiliar environment, so unfamiliar that I don't think I've ever actually been to an oval race before. Um, so yeah, no, that wasn't, wow. that wasn't a huge thing that we did. Wow. So wait, so you're looking at it and you're going, are you kidding me? You just have to turn left four times and that's it and just repeat, yeah. just pedal to the metal. Yeah. Like, I mean, it seems, granted, it's a lot harder 
driving these cars and racing than it looks. Most people are like, hey, I go up to the Kroger and get myself a loaf of bread. It's going to be the same thing. There's a lot to it, and it's really physically demanding too, especially on the on the road courses like you do, where it's like fast and slow and brakes and left turns and right turns and hairpins and blah, 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 blah. But is that like your goal to do – what's your end goal and for this? Like where do you see yourself at 25, 30 years old, like having your – as you really hit your stride in professional racing, where would you like to see yourself? Yeah, you know, so I've always had the dream uh, – as a younger kid, I actually did want to race in NASCAR for a while. Um, that was before I really understood – how everything worked in the racing world. I just like NASCAR because I liked watching crashes and nothing against NASCAR. It's not just crashes. I want to clarify that before anything else. Um, oval racing is technical and I'm sure we'll touch on it at some point, but yeah. uh, I have had a little bit of experience now. Um, but yeah, I, I, I want to race IndyCar. That's ultimately my end goal as of now. Uh, I think Formula One, unfortunately, is just a little bit past me at this point. I'm a little too old to really start on that journey, but uh, I've set myself up well to be on the on the pathway to IndyCar right now. And, you know, up to 25, 30 years old, it may be moving into endurance racing later on. That's sort of the, the path that a lot of drivers take, and it's something that I, I'm interested in as well. I'm blown away that you are 18 years old and you said I'm a little bit too old perhaps for for F1. I mean, why is that? I, I, 18 years old, heck, that seems like there's a whole bunch of track left ahead of you. Yeah, you'd think. And I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't go so far as to say that it's just completely not an option, right? But when you think about it, Lando Norris, I think his first Formula One race was... 18, 19, maybe. Uh, he had been racing F2 the year before. He had raced F4 when he was 14, something like that. Max Verstappen, his first time in a Formula One car was when he was 16 years old. Um, and a lot of these drivers make that commitment very early on to become a racing driver, uh, where they move to, they move their whole family to the, the team they want to be at. They move near the or like in the hometown of their racing team right um they join driver academies nowadays you have williams mclaren all sorts of things red bull um and a lot of those drivers that are starting in f3 are around 16 years old now um so it like i said it's not out of the question at all because you have people that are starting in formula one at you know 22 23 maybe nick devries who started when he was 28 it's just more of the fact that, um, you know, racing is a tough sport and you really have to look at things objectively as much as possible. Um, and it's sort of a sad note to talk about, but at the same time, if, if you're interested in becoming a racing driver, then you need to make your commitments and you need to make them fast. So that's sort of why I want to be racing IndyCar. I live in the U.S. My family we were not in the position where we can move to Europe to pursue Formula One anyway. And uh, I just don't have the experience at the age that I'm at in race cars that, um, you know, one would say a future Formula One driver does. Gotcha. And hey, you're you're already, you know, in cahoots with Ralph Hansen, who is a huge name in indie racing anyway. So, I mean, sounds like we're on. How many of these things do I have to say? Sounds like you're on the right track. <laughs> I, I, I think uh, that that joke is going to be good for me throughout this entire podcast. Okay, so I, I didn't mean to jump ahead, and I have a lot of questions that I want to get to that are kind of uh, really like layman questions just about racing, but I think that the people listening to this will really – it'll really kind of highlight. But let's go back again to your to the cart racing as a kid. So you got somebody oh. loaned you guys a cart, and you got out on the track. You were like, eh. Eh, whatever. Let's see if this thing will spin out. Okay. You must have done okay enough or been excited enough that we got your own cart for you. How did that first cart come about? And tell me a little bit about that experience. Yeah. Um, so, oh gosh, I, I didn't remember this until my dad had told me about it. Um, 
But when we first started realizing that this was something I wanted to do, my dad went through an incredible amount of effort con convincing my mom to let me race go-karts and not only to let me race go-karts, but to buy one. Um, and this was called kid carts at the time, which people, people still race. They're, um, very small, like four or five horsepower engines that can go maybe 30 miles per hour, if that, um, but the age range is five to eight years old. Um, but anyway, so my dad had printed out the rule book for the club that we wanted to race at, which was Concept Haulers. Um, so this was a, a racetrack in Joliet, Illinois, that was close to us, and we were going to plan on race there, racing there. And so he printed out this rule book, and he was like, you need to study this, and you need to memorize this, because there's going to be a time where I'm going to finally tell mom that we want to race, and... I'm going to have her test you to make sure you know, or sh to make sure that she feels confident you're ready for this, which is like completely ridiculous. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> it makes sense at the end of the day, he, it, his plan worked, obviously. Um, it's just funny to look back and think about this. And it's just like, obviously I, I, it's hard to, it's hard to compare it to really anything, but it's just, very funny. <laughs> I, I find it. Um, but yeah, no. So eventually I think it was ended up being just like a Christmas gift or something. Uh, I, we got a go-kart and that next season we raced it and, uh, I, um, won my first race ever in that cart. Um, so first, how did ever that race. feel? Do you remember the feeling of standing up there and, and getting your, you know, uh, trophy? So I, I don't remember the whole trophy process or whatnot, um, but it's it's such an incredible it, it's such an incredible story. It's so perfect. So this was my first ever go kart race, right? So I had practiced a little bit, but I had never raced, um, and came out and I was leading by a lot. Um, I had a knack for it. Uh, a lot of the guys in the field were also, it was also their first ever race, but, um, event, like it was still, I was leading coming around the last corner on the last lap. I, um, th the chassis had cracked. So there was an issue going on and coming around the last corner, my chain fell off. And so <laughs> I, I carried the momentum across the line like lightning McQueen with his pop tires. And I pretty much stopped right on the line, but I crossed the line first and like a second later, second place passed me, but I, I had won. It was just, it was crazy. It was, you, you couldn't have written it. You couldn't have thought it up. It was, it was Man, just awesome. Is there any video of that anywhere? Oh, did anybody? I, I, it, there may be, I would have to ask my dad. We, we had it on YouTube at one point and it went missing for a while, but if I can find it, I'll let you know because it is, it is just awesome. <laughs> that is awesome, man. That is. So how about for, for your, like your number and your color scheme, did that, has that been consistent all the way across and did you choose your number and stuff? And, and if, how did that work out? So originally my number, uh, 99 uh, was 99 was my original number. That's not what I'm running now. Um, but that was just what was on the cart when it, when we got it, the, the first kid cart, um, the color scheme was blue. And when I moved up classes, uh, e in each class, only one driver can have their number, right? Yeah. 99 is a pretty common number. A lot of people want it. So when I moved up, somebody had already taken 99. And uh, I basically went down the list. I was like, well, how about 89? How about 79? And we landed on 59 was the, the most available number. And I was, we just ran with it. So that's what I've been running. The color scheme has, uh, has uh, jumped around a bit. Obviously, it, it, it uh, changes with the teams that I run with. A lot of teams would rather run their team colors rather than my personal colors. Um, it, 
the color scheme for a while revolved around our old name, Wild Duck Racing, which we can get into in a moment. Um, but it was, you know, green, yellow, sort of like mallard duck color for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, and now we've landed on the white, black, and pink. Because uh, pink and purple are my favorite colors. And white and black go good with pretty much everything. So, uh, But that's where we are right now, 59 and white, black, and pink. Yeah, funny. You were either like six ninety nine was very common. Well, they were putting that on the go cards from the store, so yeah, it was common. And it was funny to me that you went eighty nine seventy nine fifty nine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wasn't going to mention it. I, I didn't know it at the time, of course, because I was eight. But uh, my dad right. made a good call with that. <laughs> funny though, super funny, man, super funny. Yeah, it would have okay. been rough to have a eight year old with that number, but. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's hilarious. Okay. So 2019, you find you, you get to the next level and you, and you join the, um, SCCA and like for, for people who don't know about like how the racing works, you start with the cart racing as a kid and then the next, and there's like certain levels that you have to work up through that to get to the next thing. And then you test out when you're 14 to go to the SCCA. Is that how that works? No. So karting, you can race go-karts for as long as you want. Uh, there's classes senior, which is 15 and up. And then you can do masters, which is 35 and up. And I think there's a legends class, which is 55 and up. So it's all by age range when it comes to karting. Uh, for cars, when I got my license, I went to the Lucas Oil School of Racing Um and earned a certificate that allowed me to get my license. I was 13 when I went to the school, and I think I was 14 when I got my license, which was difficult to get. You can't often get that at 14, but um, ended up working out. Uh, Lucas Oil School was great for that. They were they were super helpful. They're still around, um, and I always love, always love talking to them when I can. Um, but yeah, so whenever you feel the desire to move up to cars, you can pretty much. And you don't even have to be running carts to do it. Uh, the way the SCCA works is oftentimes you get a regional license. Uh, so that will be, you can only run in certain regions like the Chicago region, which has Blackhawk Farms, uh, I believe Road America, um, but just a few, a few small low stakes tracks and you can only run certain races in that you can only run regional races, which are usually a lot smaller, less competitive, lower stakes. Um, and so the whole idea of that is to you know, progressively work people up to the racing atmosphere. It's really dangerous and generally just not a good idea to have somebody who doesn't have a lot of experience in racing go and say, do the June sprints or any super tour race for that matter. Um, and now that I think about it, when I was 14, I got my full competition license right off the bat. And I don't think you're allowed to do that anymore. Not because of me. I just <laughs> don't think you're allowed to do that anymore. Um, but yeah, so the way it works is it's just progressive. It's about letting anyone who wants to race cars, race cars. But you have to do it as smart as possible because racing is a dangerous sport. And um I mean, one, you don't want to be held liable, but at the same time, you just really want everyone to be safe and you want everyone to have a good time. Yeah. And now SCCA, that is, is that the same uh, body that sets up tracks um, like with cones and you can go out and race like your regular street car on that thing too? Is that the same thing? There is a subset of SCCA. So there is SCCA Rallycross, which is Rallycross. Um there's SCCA road racing and there's SCCA uh, autocross. What you're referring to is autocross. So you yeah. can do that with um, cones. SCCA does that. But it, SCCA also uh, is fully amateur. Uh, they, they have something called a super tour, which is more professional. Um, although I wouldn't call it professional as I would call maybe IndyCar professional, you know. So now you're in the SCCA, and that, that's when you started racing the, the F1600? 
and I'm, I'm a, and I, I make a whole bunch of assumptions here, and half the time I just look like a jackass for even trying. But you know what? I do it anyway. I'm I'm guessing that that is a 1600cc engine. Is does that have? Yep, yes. you're right. It's a yes. 1.6 liter engine. It's um, it's actually an engine out of a Honda Fit, and um, turns I think 130 horsepower. So they're they're pretty nice. It's uh, 1100 pounds. So you know. Power to rate ratio is pretty good. Okay. Um, how, how does I've it competed. how does it feel jumping into one of those cars after come you know because that's a, that's a bit beefier than anything in the cart system, right? Um, I, I wouldn't. I think power to weight ratio. There's a few car, carts that are better than that. You got shifter carts and all that, but that's like a whole hour long discussion when you when you go into really the nitty gritty of go karts. Uh, same thing with cars, but. Um, yeah, so the F1600, it was, um, I had driven the track before Pitt, uh, Pittsburgh International Speedway. I had driven there in a go-kart before. It's a 3.2 mile track, 3.1 maybe. But um, it was all about learning the car. Um, I had done just a little bit of practice in the simulator beforehand. They don't have the track, but it was just mostly just driving, understanding how a car felt. The nice thing about the F1600s is they're wingless, so there's no downforce with them. They're about as close to a go-kart as you can get without it being a go-kart, right? So they're wingless, they're super light, the power to rate weight ratio is about 10 to one, or one to 10, sorry. Um, and Greg Rice, who I ran with, uh, Rice Race Prep, his whole philosophy is that class is designed to introduce karting kids to race cars. So he sets up his cars to act like go-karts. Um, and I didn't really realize that until I had run with him again this year. Uh, and wow, <laughs> they they don't really drive like cars, um, but you get the feel, you get the understanding of driving cars versus carts, even though it handles a little bit like a go-kart. Gotcha. Okay. And then after that, you went to the, to, is this the USF 2000? I'm assuming that's a bigger engine. And, and then something with the, um, with Mazda. Yeah. So this is where it gets a little jumbled in the form of naming classes. So USF 2000 is what, um, is a class on the feeder series to IndyCar called the USF pro championships. Uh, that is semi pro. That's, you know, that's a pretty intense series. Same thing with all the feeder series. What I did next year was I ran in the SCCA majors division in what's called a Formula Enterprise 2. Uh, this is a stock. Um, I, it's like a factory car, basically. Everything's spec. So the series provides. The series doesn't provide the car, but the series provides the only option of buying the car. So every car in that class is the same. It's the same engine. It's the same transmission. Everything on it is the same. The only thing you can change is setup stuff. Um, and you can do a little bit of carb adjustment, maybe. I'm not sure. Uh, wings, just basic things. Um, it all comes down to driver preference, really. But that's the, that's the class that I ran in for my first full season of racing. Uh, and that car had wings. It had some pretty intense downforce. Uh, it was 185 horsepower to 1250 pounds, I think it was. So a little bit more intense of a car. A lot of fun to drive. We ended up winning the championship in that season as well. Um, so that was a lot of fun. Okay. And then, and then to get all the way up to right now, you're racing the Ford Gen 3. Yeah. So, um, after the SCCA FE2 season, we were planning on racing on the USF Pro Championships ladder. Uh, at that time, it was called the Road to Indy in um, a new series called the USF Juniors. And that was uh, that whole year, 2022, was, was an incredibly tough year for us. We had started the season out with a team and every just nothing worked out. I wouldn't say everything didn't work out. Was, everything went wrong. Um, and we had to back out of the whole deal. And luckily we were saved by one of my good friends who, um, was supporting me the season before he was the owner of the car that I had run in formula enterprise. 
and he had gotten a spec mx5 car which was the nc generation miata so we ran in the spec mx5 challenge that year and um it was just a tough year all around because it set set me back so far um and it we just spent that whole season working towards something and it didn't pan out so at the end of the season we um did a race in the spec spec racer gen 3 and um i really liked that car i knew that we weren't gonna have a season together for 2023 and i was thinking to myself well if there's a way to get seat time in this thing it's great racing and it's a great learning car so that's what we did a a racing team you uh, racers are independent guys and then you eventually you look to join on a team and that is where the funding comes from that team and they get sponsors to pile on with them. Is that kind of the, the system? How, how it's so confusing. Like if you're a regular layman who maybe you see racing on television or you go to a track every once in a while, this whole part is a mystery. Nobody understands any of it. So kind of give it to me in the most simple layman term, like you're explaining it to, um, well, your grandma and myself. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is, this is the nitty gritty of racing. This is, this is the worst part to me about racing. It's um, the teams don't bring the money. Uh, the driver brings the money to the team and that's how you fund the season. So a driver up until, I mean, even Indy next, right. Even F2, even even IndyCar and Formula One, sometimes the drivers are bringing the money to the teams. Um, the teams don't uh, they don't have the incentive or the time or the money or just the the they don't have the facilities to develop a marketing program that allows them to grab drivers, grab whoever they want. Uh, that's what we ran into a lot of times, and that's why it has set us back so much is just the money aspect of racing. You just can't, um, a lot of the time, even if you're a good driver, you can't find a seat for the season just due to money. Uh, that's what I'm running into now. I've been in contact with three separate teams, all of, the, all of them series that, you know, some drivers would die to be in. And some drivers would die to be able to talk to these teams. And I'm like, they, they have contacted me. Uh, but at the same time, even though they're contacting me, they're still the ones asking for me to bring money. And that's just how racing works. Um, it's not just in the U S although it is pretty extreme in the U S it's, it's all around the world is racing. Yeah. Just a crazy expensive sport. Um, and how did you hook you're, you're with, um, wings and wheels as well as, as working with Ralph Hansen. I, I am not affiliated with them. Uh, I'm, I'm partnered with Ralph right now. So Ralph is agent and um, he's my marketing expertise. Uh, you know, we, we've tried, we spent a lot of time doing marketing and stuff on our own, but with my dad working a full-time job, I'm in school right now. So I was in high school. I'm in college now. Um, it's just not really feasible to be able to do Um you know, at the end of the day, racing is something that I would love to do, but at the same time, it, you have to weigh risks, right? Um, which is why we have Ralph. He's been a great, um, he's been great to us because it, it gives us the time. It gets, you know, the foot in the door for a lot of companies because racing sponsorship is not about putting a sticker on a car. Uh, you know, half of the money that comes from racing, you don't even know who it's coming from. Only the team does, right? Um, so there's something called the business to business, which I'm sure you've heard of before. That's what most of racing is based on now. And it's incredibly difficult to do that when you're a complete outsider. And it can take years to accomplish. And that's what Ralph has done for us. Um, so while I'm, you know, I wouldn't say wasting my time. It's just I'm running out of time to... Um, to, to learn and to, you know, make those connections, Ralph already has those connections. And so while I can focus on racing, he can focus on 
you know, developing connections, getting us the funding for next year, things like that. So a lot of what I do is I work with um, detail shops and, and, and small businesses, and we work on marketing plans and strategies for them. Um, with them, you know, they, they have a website and they push a lot of stuff out on social media and share pictures and stuff. What kind of a strategy do you have as a, as a, a young race car driver? Um, what kind of stuff do you do to market yourself and who exactly is the avatar that you're trying to put yourself ahead of? Yeah. Yeah. So what it, with, with, to, to compare your example of the detailing business, uh, I don't want to mitigate, like, I don't, don't want to diminish myself here, but detailing businesses, they offer a service, right? And it's a service that a lot of people know of and a lot of people seek. So people that want their cars detailed will, can simply go to a website and the detailer that you want to advertise will be there on that website. So it's, it's a lot easier in that sense to advertise a business. Racing is a completely viable strategy um, in a lot of different ways. It's a legitimate service that that um, racing does. Um, I actually learned this today. The, um, the UK's economy, 7% of the UK's economy is motorsports. Wow. Um, which is insane. You know, um, nine out of the 10 Formula One teams are based in the UK, I believe. So that just gives you that idea. Um, but it's, you know, it's business to business. So racing, what they utilize is they use the racetrack. They use, you know, the beauty of racing, the engines, the sounds. It's a thrilling environment. And it's something you can't get anywhere else. Uh, and so you can develop company connections. That's the whole B2B aspect of it. And essentially, a lot of racing drivers are marketing managers. So, like, one of the things that... Um... And this is just really for my own curiosity. One of the things that I do that's really helped grow the following of the of this podcast and and my place, if you will, in the microcosm of detailing is I, I put out a whole bunch of short videos on a regular basis. Is that something that's like part of the strategy that you do? And I think that if they were coming from a dude inside of a race car, like that is something that would make people pause and 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 watch it for a second, but I don't see really anybody that's, you know, doing that, or at least it's not popping up across my screen. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a perfect example of what a race car driver has, like what, what kind of advantage we can do. Like I said, I'm a, I'm a, I'm the face, right? I, I race on the weekends, but I'm an advertiser on the weekday. Right. So my job would be to advertise for your company. I'm the face of your company. In that case, if I were, you know, advertising for a detail shop, the idea that I'm a race car driver and I am like, this is me. I'm sitting in a car. I'm sitting in this detail shop because I'm a race car driver. I know about cars. You know, you can't deny that because I'm a race car driver. Um, and that, that gives you, gives your company the credibility of um you know it's like that verification aspect it's, it's like a celebrity endorsement as it were yeah absolutely um, so what yeah. what things are you doing what pieces of content or what strategy are you putting out there as the face on a daily basis to help grow your own brand because you're you're really growing your brand yeah yeah i mean it, it's things like this right um you and i talking we, we are having a great conversation, but at the same time, it's advertisement for both of us. Um, I, I try to keep up on social media posts, things like that, uh, you know, updating people on how, how my story is going. Uh, a lot of the people that follow me care about me as an individual. It's almost like, a, you know, a running biography, as it were. Um, and, and it's growing my brand. It's growing my face in the same way. Uh, we have a YouTube channel that I post pretty much every onboard race video and people go there for entertainment. And I've had a few drivers come up to me and say, Hey man, I watched your video and I like gained two seconds. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that I can kind of endorse myself on, on the track and at the track versus, you know, me, myself as a person. 
Excellent, 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 excellent. Okay, so at the level of racing that you're at now, do you have, when you when you join with a team, do they supply you with all of the ancillary people, like your pit crew and your people to work on the engine and all of that stuff as well? Or is that stuff that you also bring, like your, your own personal entourage that comes with you when you go to a team? So when you get paired with the right team, absolutely, they, they provide everything. Uh, you know, you bring them the money and that gives them the ability to create the optimal environment. Um, I, I've worked with a few teams and uh, it's just such a perfect experience. I have like, th- there's been a few teams where I've had five people on my car at all times. Like there, there's a guy pointing me out of the pit box. There's somebody who's keeping track of my tires, someone who's keeping track of my fuel. That's what represents a good race team. Um, And those are always, you know, designed to be within the race team. That's, you know, what models that um, that team chemistry. And that's that's like optimal. Um, I know a few drivers who bring their own crew. Actually, what they do is they'll buy their own car, bring it to a team and the team basically hauls it and they have their own crew. Um, and they get to like share data, share all that stuff. But that, that's a little complicated. It, it's not something um, yeah, I know. It, it's not so common that we need to go into it too much. But um, no, no, the team provides everything. And they'll even provide the suit once you're signed. Okay. okay. And how about like, um, were you able to finish high school at, at where you're from in your house, I, this isn't something that takes you on months and months of on the road, except for mo- mostly in the summer or, or did you have to have a teacher come with you and, and have alternative learning? Yeah, I was lucky. I, um, I missed a lot of school, but I, I graduated in four years. No problem. Um, I, I do know people who are either homeschooled or they go to school in a different country. Like I said, if I were to go over to England for something, I would go over to England and I would go to school for, in England, right? Um, and that that would be ideal to to be able to go to school and race at the same time, that kind of stuff. But um, no, luckily I've been able to, you know, graduate high school. College hasn't been a problem. I can schedule classes. A lot of my classes next semester are online, so I can take them whenever, uh, take them when I'm at the racetrack, things like that. That's one of the beauties of the past few years of events, I would say. No. So what does somebody who is a race car driver and on the track, there we go again, to be in a professional race car driver, what do you get? What do you take in college? What kind of classes do you take? Um, and, and super smart to take that step and set yourself up for whatever is the next step is. Yeah, it's, um, it's a bit of a complicated story right now, actually. But um, I started out in what's called the motorsports engineering at uh, it's a long name, Indiana University, Purdue University in Indianapolis. Don't worry, they're changing the name. IUPUI. Um, yep. So um, that school has the only official, you know, like actual bona fide bachelor's degree in motorsports engineering in the country. There's other around the world, but in the in the U.S., that's the only motorsports engineering degree, and it's fantastic. It's it's um I, I was involved in it for a while. Great resources, great professors, people who know a lot. And not only that, but they can bring other people in. They have job opportunities, things like that. The whole idea of me taking that class was to better myself as a driver, to get a deeper understanding of myself as, or of the car that I was driving, right? Uh, Because I I saw that in a lot of SCCA drivers where if I was getting coaching from somebody, they would tell me the car is doing this and they wouldn't tell me just that they would say the car is doing this because it's designed this way and things like that. Um, and I, I wanted that. Although, uh, the, the course that I'm in, it's just so, it was just so rigorous that, um, and there's a lot of drivers that are attracted to that program. Um, but it's just so rigorous that they tell you after, your junior year, when you get into your junior year, you have to make the decision of if you want to be a race car driver or if you want to focus on school. Um, And that was one of the reasons why I felt 
that it wasn't for me. Um, it was it was a lot of fun to be involved in it. Um, but I moved to a different program just because it's um, it, it just doesn't force me to make that ultimatum so early on. Now, and it makes sense if you can't focus on everything, especially if you're really trying to get to that professional level, you got to you got to put it all in. So is the is the current count of eight podiums and, and three wins? Is that up to date? Yeah. Yeah. So that was this year. Um, it was a good it was a solid season. We had eight out of 12 podiums. Pretty solid. Um, it could have been nine. And I lost my brakes on the last lap. That was unfortunate, but it happens. That's racing. Um, but yeah, no. So eight wins. Sorry, eight podiums. <laughs> Twelve, uh, three wins in twelve races. Yes, that is correct. Okay. So, w- at what point did you start to actually really start to feel the car to where? as you were moving up maybe from the carts originally to the next level where they're making these cars with the downforce, with more advanced things where the car actually performs different on the track. The first go-kart that you're driving in when you're six years old is just pedal to the metal and go around, right? Where did you start to feel it? Or what was the aha moment? Like when you realized drafting somebody or, or just some, one of the bigger concepts of racing a car. Yeah, it um, some some parts like slowly came around, like the drafting thing. That definitely was learning. I, I learned that in karting. Um, I learned both regular drafting and because I raced full body karts, I learned side drafting. Um, and then when it really came around to that that click, that snap moment was at the end of 2022. I had been racing a car with power steering. And oh my God, I hated it. It, it was, you just can't feel anything, right? You know, you turn the wheel with your, you could turn the wheel with your finger like that. It it was, it was terrible. Um, And then I got into the spec racer Ford and I like, you know, drove and it was just amazing. You know, I could, all my senses were just firing and I could feel every little bit of the track um, and then I got into the USF 2000, uh, and one thing to note, um, the USF 2000 is, you know, it's a proper race car. The thing about a formula car specifically is the suspension is incredibly stiff and it's incredibly low to the ground. So it's a bumpy ride. Um, you know, it's not like where you hit a pothole in your car and you go, oops, you know, I hit a pothole, you hit a, hit a pothole and you have a massive headache after that. Um, and so it's just, you know, you can feel every little bump on the track. Um, this came around, you know, I, I started becoming better at this, uh, with my rain driving. I, I like to say I'm a very good rain driver and I, a lot of people know me as a very, very good rain driver. Um, that, and then just making that switch from a power steering car to a non-power steering car where you suddenly realize everything is there because you you never know something's gone when it's no longer there but when you gain it back you go oh you know that's what i was missing so that's um that's part of it and i i think i think a lot of drivers never get to that point also uh that's one of the biggest cutoffs is where a driver can either feel or not feel the car um because there's a lot there's a lot of value in that it's not just speed, it's, you know, setup, right? So if a driver can really feel everything, like I come off the track and I tell my mechanic, you know, entry of the corner, I'm getting a little bit of understeer and it's just kind of pushing on the way out, right? But it's pushing power down. So what I think is, I think we need to soften the rebound because that will, or sorry, of course, now I'm messing this up. But like if we soften the rebound, that basically turns the car in later, but it turns the car in more because the rear end is pitched, right? That's the basics of 
feeling a car to a very deep level. And that, that comes with both speed because then you can find lines, but it comes with setup as well. So those are two very valuable things. And that straight from setup or straight from feeling the car. I think most people don't know any, 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 <laughs> any of that part of the racing. You know, though mostly a layman just looks at it and you think, oh, this doesn't even seem like a sport. They're just driving around. But it, yeah. and it really is. It's and physically exhausting, I would imagine, too. Um, what what do you do for training? Like, do you have to work out and have a proper diet and get rest and an exercise regimen that keeps you in shape for racing? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so racing is, racing is physically very difficult. You're hitting, I'm hitting up to three G's in some corners and people don't realize that, but you know, I weigh 150 pounds right now. And if I'm hitting three G's vertically, that means I weigh 450 pounds. That's a lot, you know, and and our muscles don't have the experience of, you know, that lateral force. So my head can be weighing up to like 40 pounds at some points, or, you know, my body is being pushed 40 or three times as much as it normally would be. Um, so I'm in the gym. Yeah, I should be in the gym more than five days a week, but I'm in the gym five days a week, but I have to keep under 150 pounds because if I'm over that, then I'm too heavy to be in this car, you know? So there's a very fine balance when it comes to diet, exercise, and, um, you you know, keeping, keeping a certain weight. Uh, it's surprisingly, it's surprisingly important, especially in formula cars where a car is 1300 pounds. Not only that, but these cars are so sensitive to weight that I do half and half upper body and lower body training, just so I have a lower center of mass when I'm sitting in the car. Wow. Wow. Okay. So like, if you think of, uh, of your, you know, just getting out of high school age and a lot of the people who participate in sports in high school, they're on a team and it gets support from the school and they get to be like a star in the school. Um, how about for racing? What, what was that like? Did your peers that you were going to school with recognize that you were in racing? Did you get like publicity in school from that? Did chicks think you were cool because you were a race car driver? Uh, That's funny. Um, It's always been a bit of a sensitive subject um, because a lot of people don't want to believe it. Right. Um, Especially when I was racing carts, people don't really understand what go-karting means. Really. A lot of people think K1 or something like that. Um, obviously you and I both know there's a lot more to it than just, you know, electric carts going 30 miles per hour. The carts I was racing went up to like 110 and weighed 300 pounds. So there, there was a bit of that and that's kind of carried over. I, I don't talk about racing all that much outside of that. I, I try to try to keep those two things separate, um, for a lot of different reasons, but one of them is just, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a person. I'd like to live a normal life alongside racing. It's uh, there's a lot of things that go into it. And I, I know a lot of drivers feel the same way where it's just, you know, we don't want to base our entire lives off of the fact that we're race car drivers, but um, we certainly do enjoy it. Gotcha. Gotcha. I seem to have based my entire life around selling some auto detailing chemicals. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so speaking of auto detailing, now it, it, I it, this just kind of came up when we were chatting before we started recording. But you spent a little time behind a buffer yourself, um, which kind of makes me think: okay, if you're racing and you have to put all this energy into it, and you're going to school, w- it, it, would there be time to work a job? And what kind of a job would it be? Um, tell me a little bit about that and what your experience with. Um, was with with auto detailing it it gets harder as time goes on um when i worked i worked as a prep bay worker um you know just prepping cars for detailing so getting all the tar off the rubber stuff like that um i worked over the summer so i didn't have school during that that time and i i just worked monday through uh thursday because usually i was gone friday through sunday for racing and that gets a lot tougher as time goes on uh, you know, for a lot of different reasons. One, I'm taking summer school now. 
uh, just to fill out some credits for college and things like that. So I need to really, really be on top of my schedule. Um, and I, I look at my calendar. I, I, I finally started making a calendar just because it became too overwhelming for me to just think about and uh, really visualizing it. It's, it's pretty crazy. Right now, I, I haven't been able to have the time to have a job. Uh, school, racing, working out, like those are all necessities, right? Uh, I'm luckily in a position where I don't need to be happy. I don't need a job right now, but I know a lot of drivers that do. Uh, a lot of drivers have racing related jobs conveniently. So, you know, their, their jobs, you know, give them the benefit of being a race car driver and they're allowed to kind of have leniency where they need to. If they're gone for a weekend, they're, they're like, oh yeah, well, you've got a race. That's perfect. That's awesome. Um, it's just about finding a job or an employer that is understanding of your position and then making sure that you have a time to, you know, keep yourself sane <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, one of the things, and I've spoken to some other drivers maybe guys who are even older drivers who are retired now. And one of the things that they wish that they had done, was set themselves up better for the other side because there is going to come that time in your life where it's time to retire or or you're too old to be racing cars. Have you already proactively made some kind of a retirement account or or are putting any kind of thought towards, you know, all the way down the road when you're 65 or 67 because it's coming faster than you it's it's coming as fast as you go around that track. <laughs> there I did it again. I did it again. Yeah. Yeah, I, I um banking. I, I haven't done too much banking, but um in in the sense of you know the other side, right? Because as we've said, you know, racing is very physical. I don't want to be one of those guys that's on track when he's seventy and you know just a complete hazard, right? Um, one of the things I've picked up recently, as of last year, was I started coaching people. Um, that that was a lot of a lot of fun because it was you know. A job for me it got me a little bit of money in my pocket but at the same time it helped me develop a lot of skills gave me an excuse to look at my own data things like that so i started coaching people and it i found that it's it's really rewarding in a lot of ways um you know you get the experience of teaching somebody so if racing doesn't work out then i have the opportunity i have that in my resume to say listen i'm a leader i can teach i can help people work through problems things like that on the other end, it's when I'm too old to be racing, I still have the knowledge, right? My body might not be able to do it, but my mind certainly can. So when that time comes, I expect that I'll, you know, still be involved in racing in some form, either, you know, helping manage, you know, drivers, giving people advice, coaching, things like that. I definitely, you know, I, I've looked ahead on that aspect and it's, it's definitely where I want to be. Yeah. I don't see you going to turn out to be a shift manager at the Taco Bell. <laughs> I hope not. I hope not. Nothing against them, of course. No, no, know, no. So. But, um, but you know what I'm saying. And here's what's really cool. You took the answer that you just gave led into the exact next thing I was going to ask, which was about giving back. A very interesting thing that, that you didn't mention that um, but probably might be illuminated, though, not only do you get that great feeling of helping other people and helping develop them, but when you have to slow down and teach fundamentals of something to somebody else, it further reinforces it in your brain. And it's such a healthy, healthy habit to um, get into. So it, it's, it's really good for you on so, so, so many levels. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, it's the same as anything when it comes to skills, learning things like that. Um, you know, if you're studying for a test, it's just, make a presentation and teach your family member who, who doesn't care. Right. Like if I were to, you know, go and teach my sister about derivatives or integrals or, you know, Python or C plus plus, she doesn't care, but my sister's nice enough that she's going to listen to me and being able to talk out loud to teach a subject. It definitely does reinforce. It. That's why you have like tutors and things like that. Those people are not just there for you. They're there to not to diminish, like not to make them seem like bad people, of course, but it's just 
you know, they can, there's a lot of value in teaching. Um, that's something I didn't really find out until later on, but I've, when I found out, man, I, I, I took it and ran because that's, yeah. Yeah. I like to often say I get to live vicariously through other people's um, successes. And gosh, can you imagine how many that um, Ralph has had the experience of um, being a part of their team and living vicariously through that? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't think you get to experience as many lives as him because <laughs> yeah. that is, especially with the people he's been with, it's it's um, it's incredible. I'm not sure. I, I know he's worked with the, you know, Andretti, worked with Newman Haas Racing. It's just I just can't imagine it. It's funny you mentioned live vicariously. My dad says the exact same thing. He he lives vicariously through me. Is what he says all the time. Because um, I often I often feel, you know, just a tinge of guilt when he's spending so much time on me. Um, you know, because I I know racing stresses me out, and I know it stresses him out too. And the fact that in a way I'm the cause of that stress. Sometimes I feel bad about it, but he, he always says, he's like, I'm living vicariously through you. I'm, he tells me I'm literally using you to go to the track. You know, I'm using you as an excuse to go to the racetrack. So don't feel bad about it. But, um, yeah, that's my... awesome. That's <laughs> awesome. Almost, almost makes me want to have a kid. <laughs> uh, uh, but from my experience, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, Okay. <laughs> okay. So here's kind of a, we're, we're about there. Um, now you did mention when you were six years old that you were kind of bored. So you spun out on purpose and that was kind of a little bit of an on purpose wreck. That must've felt like, whew, have you had any accidents? I mean, I think it's probably just a, um, an, an, an inevitable part of what you're doing that at some time something might go haywire. Um, and I think that probably happens lightning fast, but if you had any accidents that have like p shaken you to your core and made you scared, um, no, I've never had an accident that's made me scared. I've had some pretty bad accidents though. Um, it, it, it took me a while to do it too. I, I spent a full year and a half before I crashed a race car seriously. And, um, it was a tough feeling for me. It was a tough experience uh, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, a learning experience, um, you know, it made me, I, I remember the feeling this was at Road Atlanta um, qualifying. I was pushing too hard too early. And next thing I knew, the front corner of the car was ripped off, right? And I, and I like was dazed. And then when I came to, I was like, there's no way that this just happened. There's no way that I'm sitting here stopped on the track after crashing, you know? Um, and I was hurting, like my body hurt, my, like my ego hurt. Everything was just terrible that day. Um, and it, uh, and it was such a simple thing to the reason it was just, it was the second lap. It was like the first push lap of qualifying. And the tires weren't up to temperature. And I went a mile per hour, maybe even half a mile per hour too fast. And that's what did it. Um, but I, I've never had any any moments where I think to myself that racing it. I, I know racing is unsafe. I know every time I get into the car that racing's not safe. But I've never had a moment where I've thought to myself that, you know, I've never had that that feeling. I can't I can't put it into words because I've never felt it before. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Huh. Good, um, you know, probably that's a good thing because once you get that feeling, that could that could be the thing that kind of ends it for you. So uh, I'm I imagine that. it's probably hard to come back from. I know I I know a few people who have felt that, and yeah, I, the the biggest thing to me when it, the biggest thing that shakes me up is seeing someone else crash. Um, Cause it just looks so nasty. Right. I, I've seen cars like get totaled. I've seen people flip. I, I've seen some pretty crazy stuff and it's, you know, when I see it, it's just like, it's just such a surreal experience to see a car upside down or flying through the air. Um, <laughs> and it, I, I, all racing drivers do this. We watch 
crash videos. I, I guarantee you, anyone who, any racing driver who doesn't is lying to you. Um, but it's it's a different experience when you see it in person. Um, and it's a different experience crashing and then seeing it happen again. Or like you crash yourself and, and you have one of those moments and it's a different experience to see a crash. You don't see a crash ever, ever, ever the same. Yeah. 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 I did a fast lap or a hot lap with somebody in Austin at that track. And um, mm, totally. that guy, you would have thought he was driving to the store to get a loaf of bread. Man, <laughs> I think we did 170 maybe on that back straightaway. Wow. Um, terrifying. Yeah. Absolutely terrifying. That guy was just talking to me, driving the car. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's funny. I actually drove one of the, I drove a car at Coda. And um, this is just a side note. It, um, we're, I think we hit up to like 140 or something, nothing crazy. But in qualifying, somebody blew an engine right at the end of that straightaway. So qualifying came out, and everyone goes into that corner after going like 140 on that back stretch, hits the brakes, and there's just oil there, and everyone just goes straight. It was so uh, I, I I can't imagine how somebody sane would feel after experiencing that. But us racing drivers don't care too much. <laughs> yep. That was back when I was with a company and we were one of the sponsors for the Blanc Pain World Challenge. And um, so we got to use all the simulators and go in the paddock and all of that stuff. And I tell you what, have you have you driven on that track yourself? Oh, yeah. yeah. I don't know how you don't just the very first darn hairpin t- or the very first turn that goes to the left, you know, as you come out of the pits and you kind of go up that hill and you got to even in the simulator, I ran into the wall like almost every time, <laughs> almost every time. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's a practice in in self uh, self self control, I guess. I I've, I've spent a lot of time on the simulator, and I, I I will say there's a lot of dissimilarities with the simulator to real life. Um, and one of those is being that idea of self preservation. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, when I'm driving the simulator, I often get frustrated because I I crash a lot more in the simulator. And part of that is just the learning process. But at the same time, it's also I'm not trying as hard to keep myself from dying in the simulator. And that gets me annoyed. Um, I see this most often when I'm doing rally games and stuff like that. I crash so much in those because I'm just like, eh, screw it. We'll just go flat out through this corner and it'll be fine. So credit to you where credit is due. Sim racing, when it comes to that self-control and developing that, it's a lot harder than it is in real life. So you know, maybe it's not fully comparable, but once you, once you, once you get that down in your mind, it it becomes a lot easier. Okay. And then, so who is your racing hero? The, somebody that you've looked up to and it could be old school, new school. I don't know. It's your story. Tell me who your like big guy that you look up to is. Yeah. This might be a little bit of a boring question. Uh, or sorry, not a boring question. Sorry, a boring answer. Um, Cause I don't, I don't really have a racing hero. Um, back when I was number 99, I loved Carl Edwards. Uh, he was number 99 in NASCAR. So it just kind of worked out. Um, but then I didn't really like NASCAR. And so that and he retired too. And once he retired, I was sort of off it. Um, and I was too young to really know of him as a person. As it turns out, he's a really nice guy, a great person. So that's nice. I feel good about liking him. Um, but I've never just, I've just never had that, that hero in racing. A lot of the people that I look up to when it comes to racing end up being the people I work with. Um, just incredibly smart and helpful and generous people, all with the same mindset of just wanting to win, wanting to go fast. And I, I admire that most out of anything else. I, I feel really grateful to have the experience of, you know, working with these people that I end up looking up to in such a way. So that, that's my sort of boring answer to the question. I don't, I don't necessarily have the racing hero in me, but it's, it's uh, not yeah. boring at all. Not boring at all. That is you. You are the man who is doing this. <laughs> so your answer is absolutely correct. And as exciting as everything else that you have going on. So uh, 
I've I appreciate everything that we got to sit down here and talk about. I know I threw some kind of questions at you that were maybe a little bit of layman, but I think this is really going to help explain a lot of the racing to people who who just don't know. And that's really valuable in helping more people be engaged with the sport. Yeah, you know, I'm really happy to do this. I'm happy to do do a podcast with somebody. I, all the podcasts I've done, at least as far as I can remember, are pretty racing centric. And so being able to be that person that kind of communicates racing from a different perspective is is really nice to me. I am I'm really happy to be able to want to, to be able to be the one to do it. Um, and just, you know, explain racing from the perspective of a driver and not, not that it's not glamorous, but it's not as glamorous as a lot of people think from the outside in. Um, and, you know, just get down to the nitty gritty, get an understanding of it. And I'm, I'm really happy to be here. It's, it's been a blast talking to you. It really has. Awesome. Well, if somebody wants to follow Mr. Jason Pribble, how do they do that? Uh, yeah, so we've got a bunch of bunch of social media stuff. We have um, Instagram, it's Jason Pribble Autosports, and then I have a personal account, which is just Jason Pribble. Um, we have Twitter, which is Jason Pribble Autosports, uh, Facebook, Jason Pribble Autosports, YouTube, Jason Pribble Autosports. We also have a website called JasonPribbleAutosports.com. Um, it's a little bit behind, but what we do is we just do a blog after every weekend, just kind of running through the weekend on a more, um, more, you know, detailed basis, you know, something that an Instagram post or something can't really express, you know? Uh, so if you're interested in reading into that, we have got like pictures on that videos as well. So there's a lot of places you can find us. Um, you can reach out to us on any of those platforms as well. And if you're looking for him on the track, all you're going to see is the back of his helmet and the back of his car. <laughs> I like that. All right. Jason, thank you so much for taking some time out of your day. You're in your busy schedule. You're at PRI right now um, to hang out and, and share some of your story with um, everybody here on Owner's Pride Podcast. Yeah, no, like I said, I, I really meant what I said. It's um, It's been a lot of fun talking to you. It really has. It's um, You do a good job. I've, I've had some I've had some interviews in the past that don't go as well. But um, from somebody who isn't as familiar when it comes to racing, you did a great job. So I appreciate it. I really do. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to hang out with us here on the Owner's Pride Podcast. If you found value in what we were putting out, please take a moment and hit the like and subscribe button. If you're more interested in listening to it instead of watching, then we're available everywhere for audio podcast. And if you use code ECOWASHTHEWORLD at checkout on ownerspride.com, you're going to get 10% off of your order. Again, thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to hang out with us here. Without you, it would just be me talking to myself. Until next time, stay glossy.